What is it that women really want from men? I talk to a lot of men who have been hurt by women, and usually what they tell me is that all that women really want is money, a man who looks good, and financial security. I also talk to a lot of women, and they often tell a little bit different story, but honestly, that doesn't really matter, right? Because you know that what people think they want and how they actually behave doesn't always line up. And the statistics show that women do tend to choose men who make more money, who look a certain way, who are a certain height. Right? There's a lot of evidence that suggests that this is true, and it makes a lot of sense because both societal messaging and women's biological drives to reproduce and raise children would suggest that those are the things that women would value in a relationship. As much as that makes sense, it's not the whole story. And I know that it's not the whole story for two reasons. First is because there are thousands of women right now today who are divorcing wealthy, good-looking men. In fact, this is one of the biggest sources of confusion that I hear from divorced men, that they were good providers, that they were good fathers, that they were loving partners, they created a great life for her and for her kids, and yet she divorced them. Right? If it was really about money and looks, then the vast majority of my clients would still be married. The other reason I know that this money and looks and financial security isn't the entire story is because there are outliers in the data. Now, the statistics are pretty overwhelming. Trust me, I have seen them and men have shown me many. The statistics around how women will only be with a man who makes at least $100,000 or at least who makes more money than they do. And they won't be with a man who's shorter than them and he has to be older than them, but not too much older than them. There's so many statistics about what women want and about whether or not relationships are going to last, but there are also outliers. There are stories that don't fit the mold. There are couples who stay together against all odds who are still married at 85 after financial devastation and the deaths of children and chronic illness. And there are women, there are beautiful, amazing women who marry poor, ugly men. And yes, I know you're like, whatever, Rachel, it doesn't happen very often and it's probably not going to happen to me, but it does happen sometimes. Don't you want to know why? What is going on in these situations that don't fit the norm, that don't fit the curve? If we throw out the outliers and we just decide that all women want money and looks, or at least most of them do, and they're probably not capable of love, which is an argument that I hear argued quite well, quite often, then you're screwed because now you're either going to end up alone or taken advantage of, and there's really no other option. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live my life with that kind of bitterness. That is a shitty outcome, and I don't want to accept it as reality when there's evidence that there's something else going on here. So I've been asking this question, what is it really? Why is it that women are divorcing good-looking, wealthy men? Why is it that some women are with men who don't meet this criteria that the statistics tell us they should in order to be with this kind of a woman? What is it that has made my own marriage work? Why am I attracted to my husband? Why do I stay with him? I've been asking these questions and I think I've landed on the answer. What women want is a very specific form of emotional security. If you have no idea what that means or that has you just groaning, I don't blame you. It sounds like this vague and confusing idea, emotional security, but we have to figure out what that means and somehow provide this to a person. It's a lot easier to just say, no, women want money and good looks. And I'm not just blaming men for this, for taking the easy way out and saying, well, women just want this. Women are not good at this either. Women are horrible at providing emotional security for men. In fact, most people are just not good at this in our society. We have no idea how to provide this kind of security for our partners, even though it's what women want. And honestly, it's what men want too, as far as I can tell from the conversations that I've had with men. So it's my intention in this video to clearly define what this kind of emotional security actually is, how you can give it to somebody else, and also how you can get it for yourself, if it is what you in fact want for yourself as well. If you have been finding my content helpful, please subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications so you hear about my new videos. That goes a long way to helping me grow this channel and get these conversations out in the world. As you're gonna see as we talk about this, a big part of the problem in so many relationships is that people aren't talking about these things. We aren't having these conversations and that handicaps all of us in our relationships. So please subscribe, please share these videos. You're helping me start this conversation that we all really need to be having. If we start looking at those outlier relationships, the ones that don't fit the norm, right? The couples that stay together through chronic disease and lost fortunes, or the women who are married to guys who just 
aren't rich and aren't good looking and don't seem to have any of the qualities that women are supposedly looking for. What is it that's making it work? I'm gonna argue that it's the way she feels when she's with him. And I'm not talking about love. I'm not talking about lust or chemistry or pheromones. And I am certainly not talking about that passionate, wild, twin flame, soulmate kind of love that the romantics try to sell us on. What I'm talking about is the incredibly calming, grounding sense of peace and safety that we feel when somebody else sees us when we're at our worst and doesn't decide that that defines who we are. Emotional security happens when someone has seen us, the worst parts of us, the craziest bits of us, and yet doesn't buy into the illusion that those actions define our true selves. Usually we do exactly the opposite, right? We say, oh my gosh, she's crazy, or he's a control freak. And we accuse our partners of being weak people, of being angry people. And then we congratulate ourselves for dodging a bullet when we get away from someone. We're like, oh wow, turns out he was actually nuts. Like, thank God I got out of there. We talk as though our worst actions define who we truly are. And maybe you believe that they do. After all, if our actions don't define us, what does? But we are on dicey ground here because if our bad actions, if our worst actions define us, well, then we are all in some serious trouble. There is not a single person who's going to watch this video who has never gotten hijacked by their emotions and lashed out or overreacted or acted in a way that wasn't appropriate to the circumstances. We all have specific and unique ways in which we act inappropriately at certain times. If you haven't watched any of Alain de Botton, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name. If you haven't watched any of his videos, he says this amazingly well and you should really check him out. The way he describes it is that none of us escaped childhood without becoming unbalanced or a little bit mad in one way or the other. And he is absolutely right. Think about your childhood, your infancy, the early years, school. Nobody was completely safe as children, not emotionally, and for many people, not physically either. And if you doubt this, walk through any middle school. There is not a child in America who has gone through our modern school system and was emotionally safe the entire time they were there. What that means is that as children, every single one of us had to find ways to make it through. We had to figure out how to survive. Some of us learned that we had to fight back. Others learned that we needed to hide or shut down to stay safe. Some of us learned that we had to be loud and anxious to get love or attention, while others learned that we had to be perfect and show not a single sign of weakness if we wanted to be worthy of love. And we all take these survival reactions from our childhood forward into our adult relationships where they cause so many problems. And right? if I learned as a child that I had to be perfect and that I couldn't show any weakness, and then I take that into my marriage with my husband, I might subconsciously believe that I have to be perfect in order to be worthy of his love, which leaves no room for my human experience, no room for my weakness, for my sorrow, for my anger, for my fear. And guess what? That's not sustainable. I can't hold it together like that for a whole lifetime with somebody. So at some point, I'm going to crack under all that pressure that I'm putting on myself. And when I do, how am I going to act? Am I going to lash out and blame it all on him? Am I going to shut down and cease functioning and not talk to anybody? How I react in those moments of strain, of stress, is going to depend entirely on what strategies I learned as a child. Not one of us escapes childhood without some of these tendencies coming with us. And yet as adults, we don't talk about it. So we find ourselves in adult relationships, but when we feel threatened or unsafe, we start acting like children. We start showing up like a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, a two-year-old in a temper tantrum, or sometimes even like a teenager, heaven forbid. And it happens because that's how we made it through our childhood in the moments when we actually weren't safe as kids. And then we've never stopped to look back at it. We've never stopped to think it through and nobody talks about it. Because we learned these things when we were so young, they're really deeply wired into our nervous systems. Every time we feel threatened and our nervous system gets activated into a fight or flight state, these almost automatic reactions start to take place inside of us. They're very deeply rooted. And that's not to say that we can't change them. We can. It's just to say that it's not easy. And it takes a lot of deep awareness and patience and time and work to heal those past wounds. And it takes teaching our nervous systems that we really truly are safe here and now in our adult lives. 
But it also means that when we act out in these inappropriate ways, or crazy ways even, that isn't a defining statement about who we are. It's just a statement about what we went through as children and how we survived it. I am a 36-year-old woman. I am intelligent, I am compassionate, I am resourceful, and I am a committed and loving partner who is building a life intentionally with my husband. And sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm exhausted or afraid, I shut down like the five-year-old who felt abandoned during my parents' divorce. And sometimes I lash out like the teenage girl who felt like her life was not hers to control. I happen to be really, really lucky because I am married to a man who understands the difference. And because he understands the difference between who I am and how I act when my nervous system gets activated into a fight or flight response, because of that, he can create emotional safety for me. And he's very, very good at it. I didn't realize that he was doing this. We have been together for nearly 12 years, and I am only just now starting to appreciate the gift that he has given me this whole time. I'm finally seeing that this is the number one reason that I was attracted to him in the first place, and it is the reason that we have stayed together through some difficult years. The simple thing that my husband does to create emotional security for me is this. He doesn't look at me like I'm batshit crazy even after I've been acting like I was. It's that simple. We met when I was 24 years old. I can tell you I have some unhelpful patterns from my childhood that I brought forward into this relationship, and I still have some of them. I'm becoming more aware. I am much more conscious. I am able to self-regulate better. I am able to make different choices, but sometimes I'm not. And the reality is that it is a lifetime process to unwire these old habits. And when I fail, at that, when I get upset or shut down or inappropriately angry, my husband does two essential things for me. First, he doesn't take it personally. He knows it's not about him. Well, he knows that part of it's about him, right? There is something happening between us in that moment that we need to resolve. But my overreaction, that's not about him. And so he doesn't take that on and make it mean something about him or something about me. He knows that is my shit from long before I met him, from something that I experienced that feels similar to this moment of conflict that I'm in with him. And by not taking it personally, he keeps himself calm. He doesn't have to join me in that fight or flight response. The second thing that he does for me is maybe the greatest gift I have ever received from any human being. He doesn't hold it against me. He doesn't punish me for acting that way. And he doesn't take those moments of my weakness and stash them away to use as weapons to hurt me with later. Instead, in the morning when he wakes up, he looks at me and he sees the resourceful, intelligent, compassionate woman that he married and he trusts me to find my way back to that part of myself. He sees me, who I actually am, in the moments where I don't see myself. That is emotional security. I want to be crystal, crystal clear here. I am not saying that you need to love somebody's batshit craziness. And I'm not saying that you need to accept harmful behaviors. You don't need to be yelled at. You certainly do not need to be hit. And you don't even need to just be there and get the silent treatment or be tormented by your partner. I'm not saying that you have to love those things about them. And I'm not even saying that you have to accept them. You can set boundaries for yourself. You can choose to walk away. You can choose to not engage when they're acting like a six-year-old or a two-year-old or a 16-year-old. That's fine. You can still provide them with emotional security and not be actively involved with their shit. In fact, that's part of not taking it personally, right? It's not about you. You're the target. They're lashing out at you, but you can remove yourself from that. The difference is how are you thinking about them when you do that? Are you looking at them and thinking, oh my gosh, who did I marry? What have I done? Who is this person? Are you looking at them in those worst moments and thinking that you're seeing their true nature? Or are you holding on to this faith that that's not actually them, that they are this warm, capable, intelligent, grown person, and that this is how they act when they're threatened? This is that childhood weakness that we all carry in our own unique ways. When you set those boundaries, when you choose to remove yourself from that situation, and when you re-engage with them later, are you seeing them as the worst parts? Or are you trusting that they are the person you know them to be, and that this is just the way they act when they feel threatened? I think the coolest thing about this is what it actually does for the other person. When you don't take it personally, and when you don't hold a grudge, when you see them for who they are, 
and you allow a little bit of grace for the fact that they are human and that they're bringing some crap with them into this relationship and sometimes they're going to act crazy. When you hold that space for somebody, it helps them. It's very, very similar to what I have learned to do for my clients as a coach. You are giving them the opportunity to calm down and to reconnect with themselves. That is all that any of us need. This is the secret to good coaching. As a coach, I don't fix anybody's problems. It's not my job. I'm not here to tell you what you need. I am here to hold a space for you where you are safe enough to come out of the crazy, out of those patterns, out of the reactivity for your nervous system to calm down. Because as soon as it does, you become rational again. You become resourceful. I see this work over and over and over in my coaching, and I'm starting to appreciate how my husband has given me room to do this in our marriage and how much that has helped me in my own personal growth. Remember that our crazy comes out when we don't feel safe. It's part of our unique way of responding to a perceived threat. So when somebody is acting out in their own defense, even if that is a totally unproductive and unhelpful way of acting, if you look at them like they're crazy or treat them like they are or talk to them like they are, that's not going to help them feel safer. I've learned this with my clients. You have to meet them where they're at. If they're bitterly angry, if they're hysterically upset, then that's okay. That's where we are. And you allow it and you're present or you're not, right? If you're not a coach, if this is your wife or your husband we're talking about, you can go away, but you don't go away with anger and defensiveness and fear. You go away with an understanding, okay, this person is caught up in this fight or flight response right now. They're living from their survival self. And when you just allow that to be happening and you don't make it mean something horrible about them or about you, eventually might take minutes or hours or days, but eventually They're in that and they realize that nothing is happening. Nothing's getting worse. Nothing is becoming a big problem. And they start to notice that they are in fact safe, that it's okay. The moment somebody feels truly safe, that the threat is gone, they come back to themselves. I see this over and over and over again with my clients. It is not so different from what happens with a young child. If you have a child who is just throwing a temper tantrum, you usually don't look at them and say they're crazy. You say, oh, they must be hungry or wet or scared. And so you have compassion for them. And you also don't expect them to just snap out of it because you know that that's not how emotion works. You know they have to go through it and eventually they'll calm down and you'll meet that need and they'll be okay. Right, And they do. The child calms down as soon as they start to feel safe and seen. This happens with adults too. It happens with my clients when I hold space for them. And it happens with me when my husband holds space for me. As soon as we feel safe, those survival reactions, those crazy reactions just fall away because they're not who we really are. That's just the way we behave when we feel threatened. I love this in coaching because As soon as that moment happens, all of a sudden, I'm not talking to a frightened six-year-old or an angry two-year-old anymore. All of a sudden, I am speaking to an adult, somebody who has 30, 40, 50 years of life experience, of wisdom, of perspective. And guess what? That person is perfectly capable of solving their problems. I don't need to do it for them. What I need to do is help create a space where they can reconnect to that. This is what women really want. They want a man who does not define them by their worst actions, by the actions they take when they feel hurt or tired or afraid. They want a man who doesn't forget that they are capable and resourceful adults even after they've been acting like weak children. You don't have to be perfect at this in a relationship. My husband is not perfect at this. I am not perfect at doing it for him either because he has his own patterns that come up when he's having a hard day. It doesn't matter though. You don't have to do it all the time. You don't have to do it most of the time. Any brief moment that you can do this for someone else, that you can look at somebody and remember that the actions they've taken do not define who they actually are. The smallest bit is an amazing gift and they will remember you for it. What you might be seeing is that creating emotional security for somebody has very little to do with what you actually do or say. It has everything to do with what you're thinking when you look at them. And this is really cool because people can tell if you are looking at your partner and thinking, holy shit, what is wrong with them? Who did I marry? What happened to my amazing wife? They can tell. They can tell when you think they're nuts. And they can also tell when you feel sorry for them or think that they're not capable. And this is a trap that I see so many men falling into because they see their partner's flaws and weaknesses and they don't judge them as crazy or bad. Instead, they see them as somebody who needs to be rescued. 
And that's what they do. They provide, they take care, they handle everything and they make this life for them. And then they're shocked when the woman files for divorce, right? When she's not happy about being rescued. But think about this for a moment. When you're rescuing me, what is the message that you're giving me? You're telling me that you don't think I'm capable. You don't think I'm resourceful. You think I need rescuing. You think I am like a child who needs somebody else to come in and take care of it for me. Basically, you're telling them that you do think who they are is defined by those childhood patterns that they've brought forward. That is why so many women divorce men who are amazing providers. It's because being seen by your partner as capable and resourceful is more important than money or financial security. It'd be a lot easier if it was just money and good looks, wouldn't it? And I, I think that's why we focus on that part of this story and we tend to ignore the outliers. We don't look for the deeper underlying cause because if it's just money and looks, then you can do something about it, right? If women want a man who makes 100K a year, then you got to go make 100K. Or you can also just write off women because they're obviously not capable of love. And so why bother? It's just much simpler because to really create emotional security for somebody, you actually have to have faith in that person and you have to have faith in yourself. And neither of those things is so easy to cultivate. Emotional security requires you to first trust that people will naturally self-regulate when they don't feel threatened, and that when they do self-regulate, they will be resourceful enough to deal with their lives. It also requires you to be self-aware enough to recognize your own patterns and your own insecurities and the ways that you are not allowing the people you care about to show you how capable and resourceful they are. But at the end of the day, this work is so worth doing because we can do something amazing for the people that we care about and they can do it for us. We can hold space for them to become aware that they're not in danger, that they're not threatened, and allow them to reconnect back to who they really are. That is such a cool thing to be able to give to somebody. But does any of this matter if women don't know that this is what they want, right? Like what about initial attraction? Because I told you I wasn't aware that this is why I was with my husband. And I know right now there are lots of women out there on the internet who are swiping left, right? They're searching for that tall, dark, handsome, wealthy king of men somewhere on the internet apps. Here's what I can tell you for certain about attraction. When you look at somebody and you think well of them, when you have absolute faith in the goodness of who they are, how healthy and resourceful their core self is, when you look at them and you see that, they can feel it. And it feels incredible to have somebody look at you that way. We do not get this often enough. And I mean, we people, not we women. Men don't get this often enough. Children don't get this often enough. We as humans do not get this kind of attention and faith often enough. If you can do this for somebody, they will be drawn to you. Women will want to be close to you because of the way it feels to have somebody look at you like that. And the amazing thing about that is that women will be drawn to it even if they don't know why. I just told you it took me 12 years to figure out that that big part of the reason I am so attracted to my husband. And this is actually the reason why women want money and good looks in the first place. They think that being loved by that kind of man is going to make them feel a certain way. And that feeling they're looking for is this feeling of really truly being seen as a healthy, resourceful person. So yes, women do want money and good looks and security because they think that having those things is going to make them feel seen. It's the feeling that matters. It's not the money. It's not the looks. People are attracted to the way that they feel when they're with you. That has nothing to do with how tall you are, how much money is in your bank account, or how symmetrical your facial features are. It has everything to do with what you're thinking about that person when you're with them. If you've stayed with me this long, thank you. And please talk to me in the comments. This is a conversation. This is not me telling you absolutely this is how it is. This is a conversation we need to start having. What is really going on? What do men need and want? What do women need and want? Let's get past the surface level. Let's get past the statistics and talk about what's really going on. So tell me what resonated for you and tell me what didn't. I wanna hear from you in the comments. What is your experience? What is true for you in your heart? What draws you to people? Why do you wanna be around some people and not around others? If you totally disagree with everything I just said, tell me about it. I want to hear in the comments and I want to keep this conversation going because I think these are some of the most important questions we can ask and start to explore if we want to have better relationships. So thank you for bearing with me and being here for this conversation. And I look forward to continuing it in the comments. 
If you found this video helpful, then you have to check out my free masterclass, how to take back control of your life after divorce. In that hour long masterclass, I go into way more detail than I can cover on these YouTube videos about how specifically to start to heal, to stop the painful emotions, regain your confidence and take back control of your future. I break it down into steps and give you a lot of actionable items that you can start using right now today to start feeling better. You'll find the link in the video description below under free masterclass, how to take back control of your life after divorce. I hope to see you on the masterclass and in the next video here on YouTube. Thanks for watching.